May I have your attention? <laughs> Please? Well, he's supposed to do it. I think he's going to do it. Are we ready? <laughs> do we have the microphone? No? Hello? <laughs> They're not paying attention to me. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephanie Raleigh. I'm the department head in landscape architecture and regional and community planning. And I am thrilled to welcome you to this afternoon's ECTAL lecture. The ECTAL lectures were established over 35 years ago in memory of one of our alums who was an architect and had a wonderful career that his family and friends wanted to honor with a lecture series. And that brings us together at least twice a year for some very remarkable lectures. We rotate those lectures between the disciplines and this lecture is sponsored by Regional and Community Planning. We have found a lecture who exemplifies what the ECTAL is all about. Um, the ECTALs ask that we look for people who demonstrate leadership in the design professions and use that in an advocacy role to improve communities. And I don't know that we could have found anyone better than Ken Bring Greenberg to be the ECTAL lecture this fall. Ken is the author of Walking Home, and I love the subtitle, The Life and Lessons of a City Builder. He's going to share with us his perspectives on cities and his experience in working um, around the world, literally, as an advocate for restoring public spaces and public use and um, the ways that we think about improving our cities collectively and as designers. Ken lives in Toronto and is a consultant. He also has served as the director of the urban design and architecture department for the city of Toronto. And I think that um, probably most noteworthy is that he is the recipient of the 2010 American Institute of Architects Thomas Jefferson Award for public design excellence. So please join me in welcoming Ken Greenberg. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, and it really is uh, a pleasure to be here. I've had uh, already an enjoyable afternoon, a lunch with uh, a group of students sharing ideas. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, sharing some thoughts with you this afternoon. And what, I, what I'm going to talk about is an extraordinary paradigm shift um, that we are now experiencing um, in North America and around the world. And this really um, begins and it, it kind of follows my life um, in the decades after World War II, taking us to the present. And it is really the, the subject of my book, Walking Home. I, I started off writing this book as um, a kind of serious professional memoir. And as I got into it, I realized that the, the personal story, what I and my family and um, people I knew went through in terms of a first paradigm shift uh, was as much the story as the work I have done as a professional. So just, just to put this in context, I was born in New York City, um, in Brooklyn. Uh, this is the neighborhood where I used to go shopping with my grandmother, um, Avenue M. Uh, I lived in one of those six-story apartment buildings that are ubiquitous in New York. And my family, like so many others, um, after World War II, um, my aunts, my uncles, um, pretty much everyone we knew made the journey from the city as part of that great exodus out to suburbia. And we ended up living in a variety of places, including uh, this very nice house on Beacon Street in Newton, Mass., which is a suburb of Boston. Um, we didn't realize it at the time, uh, but this was a migration that involved tens of millions of people uh, moving pretty much in the same direction for the same reasons. 
So what, what happened in that period is that North Americans, um, in pursuit of a, of a very complex set of centrifugal forces, forces fleeing the center, uh, combining polemics, anti-city polemics that had gathered force in the decades before World War II, um, cheap energy, um, a gallon of gas in 1950 in the U.S. cost 18 cents, just, just to put that in perspective, uh, basically moved themselves out of cities. We were phenomenal city builders. Uh, this image of 1940s Manhattan was replicated across the continent in cities, large, small, medium size. Uh, we were building in ways that were all, all the things that we like to talk about now, transit oriented, um, active pedestrian life, animated ground floors of buildings, mixing places of work, places of living, shopping, um, all of the facilities of modern life. And the image on the right is, was a key moment in that shift in 1939 at the New York World's Fair, um, a very famous um, pavilion uh, with the participation of General Motors and a number of other major corporations uh, Futurama, your world of tomorrow, and this is where um, what people were selling was not so much a product, a vehicle, they were really selling an entirely different way of life. And what's, what's led to that, among other things, as I said, it was a complex combination of things, but in those years before the war, um, all of the intellectuals, all of the thought leaders, or almost all, who were dealing with the issue of the city, and it, uh, what you see in the photograph is the members of CM, the International Congress of Modern Architecture, at one of their gatherings, had come to the conclusion that you see expressed in the diagram on the lower right, where you see their vision of towns and cities up until 1900, and then um, 1935, and that, that could be Le Corbusier's reaction to New York, which he saw as totally uh, chaotic and dysfunctional, and then at the bottom where it says, um, demain, tomorrow, um, this rational, ordered version. And whether it was Le Corbusier and Radiant City, or Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City, or Ebenezer Howard's Garden City, as different as those visions were, what they all had in common was a starting assumption that the city as we had known it for millennia was obsolete and had to be replaced by something else. And I wanna just do a little diversion here and I'm gonna show you a video produced by the Disney Corporation in 1958 because it, it's one thing to talk about these things in the abstract, but I want to convey to you the intoxication that people felt around the possibilities in that 1939 uh, World's Fair pavilion and what the automobile was going to do. And you, what's so interesting about this video is some of it to our eyes and ears is funny. Some of it was actually prescient in interesting ways in terms of technology, but <laughs> could in particular pay attention to the places in the video where they, they describe explicitly the transformation of cities. Shield becomes a radar screen showing the outline of objects ahead. 
Or fog may be eliminated by dispelling devices along the right of way. Dashboard panels featuring built-in safety controls and electronic operating devices are predictions for tomorrow. A teletype panel shows up with a minute traffic bullet. The recommended safe driving speed is automatically indicated. Our rear view mirror is actually a television picture.
non-stop farm to market freightways will bring remote agricultural areas to within minutes of metropolitan markets. At transfer points within the city, individual units automatically separate from the truck train for immediate delivery to shopping centers. Here they open up to become food dispensers. The other carrier sweeps directly to a seaport destination where it becomes a neatly stacked unit in the ship's hold. To meet faster delivery schedules, these highways of commerce lead to launching ports, where the mobile freighter becomes the payload of a cargo rocket. Highway and automotive design will move forward together. First, we'll have the more efficient gas turbine car, then the speedier jet, the inexhaustible atom, Possibly the sun-powered electro-suspension car, which needs no wheels. These spectacular conceptions will lead to new dimensions for the American highway. Such visionary ideas, which today seem sheer fantasy, will be commonplace to future generations. There will be miles of tubular highways. Routes across hot desert wastelands, over sub freezing mountain ranges, and even under the ocean. These giant arteries will link together all nations help create a better understanding among the peoples of the world. As in the past, the highway will continue to play a vital role in the progress of civilization. It will be our magic carpet, new hopes, new dreams, and a better way of life for the future. So are you all convinced? Uh, let's see, how do I get back to my... Any suggestions here from the audience? Yeah. Is there one here? Okay. So people really, you know, we, we look at that in a certain way, but people really took that seriously. And when Eisenhower was president, we built 46,000 miles of those highways very rapidly. And although he had sold them, having seen the autobahns in Germany for military purposes, they actually became the conduits that led people out of cities. And based on that kind of hubris and that unquestioned belief in technology of that day, what people used to refer to as technology, and in particular the automobile, we changed our way of life profoundly. So one of the major department stores in Canada is appropriately named Canadian Tire. And you can see the on their building, driving, playing, living, and I cheated a little bit with Photoshop and stuck in working, but that was the idea. We would get to everything by automobile. And so the problem is that as this vision was implemented, it turned out not to be scalable. And for the larger reality, um, for the larger population, the reality was really not like the dream at all. The image on the left is a clip from a film, a very funny film called uh, Radiant City. It's a mockumentary about life in suburban Calgary. And just as a little advertisement, I, I have a small part in that film, but it's about a family um, living on the outskirts of Calgary in a new suburb, and the gentleman whose face you see in the rearview mirror there is contemplating this 
life of sitting in his automobile for hours every day that he has now uh, forced to live. Um, those interchanges that we've created, uh, I don't think you have one quite like that in Manhattan, Kansas, but uh, you see them in, in cities a, across uh, North America. Uh, that interchange alone is almost the size of the city of Venice. Uh, so what's fascinating is that this paradigm starts testing to failure as quickly as it's built. So here's a Life magazine cover from 1960, June of 1960, showing that the highways fill up as quickly as they're built. Um, we start doing things that have eventually led to climate change or contributed significantly to climate change, although people were hardly aware of it at the time. Uh, we also have a public health crisis um, and increasingly medical officers of health um, in cities are, uh, and um, across the, uh, our two countries are getting involved in issues, especially with children, with diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and obesity at levels we've never seen before. The combination of being driven everywhere and sitting with mobile devices has had a devastating effect on public health. And, of course, we have fracking notwithstanding, we have the arrival of peak oil and stresses on the cost of energy and people's ability to continue to have that way of life uh, that they thought they would have in perpetuity. So I actually begin my book, I begin this story with a walk through the rings of time out of pretty much any city in North America and in many parts of the world. And what you find is in the pre-war parts of the city, you will have a very easy adaptability to 21st century life. Uh, parts of the city, such as depicted in the upper left, which were designed before the automobile, lend themselves to the introduction of new uses, to active sidewalks, to alternative forms of transportation. But as you move clockwise through the decades after World War II, what you find is the streets get wider and wider. You have the introduction of these strip malls and plazas that push buildings back from the sidewalk uh, to make room for parking lots, eventually turning into malls and power centers and you have a world where pedestrian, people on foot are simply not meant to be. You feel like you're standing on the tarmac of an airport. So that was round one, but round two is really interesting, and that, that's the paradigm shift that we are in now. And it is a delayed aftershock as the assumptions, the underpinnings of that first paradigm have unraveled and this second paradigm, which is as profound, as far-reaching as the one that occurred in the post-war decades is, actually, is underway. And what's <coughs> happening, and, and this really was not anticipated uh, by anyone to the extent that it is happening, is that younger people, starting with Generation X and through Generation Y, and in particular the millennials, are voting with their feet across North America and what they're opting for is urban places, which are seen to be a way to a more sustainable and satisfying future in very personal ways. This is not driven by ideology, it's driven by people making personal choices. So on the left is a daily scene in my neighborhood in Toronto. On the right is Bryant Park in New York behind the 42nd Street Library. It's a spring afternoon, nothing special going on by way of programming or festival or event, simply young people gathering, some with families, uh, just enjoying the sun in this park. This park, by the way, shortly before that, had been taken over by drug dealers. It was a fearful place. It was referred to by some as Needle Park and has now turned into one of the great spaces in New York City. So what happened is this very pervasive post-war North American dream has lost its luster, and in fact, a competing dream has emerged reflecting very, very different priorities, and it can be simply stated as living in a neighborhood where you can walk to buy your groceries 
and take transit to work. That has become something which is widely sought after. And um, the ULI, and I know some of the students are working on a ULI competition. Uh, the ULI published this survey uh, a couple of months ago, which is about where North Americans want to live. And what they're saying is that there is a strong emerging demand. And mind you, these are developers talking to their members who make money by producing development. They're saying, pay attention. There is a strong demand for these walkable places, for these compact communities uh, within a changing demographic. These are a couple of really interesting uh, graphs that appeared in The Economist little over a year ago, and it's about reaching peak car. Who would have imagined this? Uh, on the left is a phenomenon in the developing world which is showing up everywhere called demotorization, which is a decrease in the vehicle kilometers or miles traveled on an annual basis, which is starting to show up in country after country uh, by private automobile. On the right is I think even more interesting, this is a study done at the University of Michigan, and it's a snapshot of when people get and retain driver's licenses. And you have two years in the lighter blue, you have 1983, and in the darker blue you have 2010. Well, in my day, getting a driver's license at age 16 was one of the most important rites of passage. Uh, I think the first day that I could actually go and claim my license, I went and took my test and got the license and couldn't wait to get my first second-hand car. Uh, so you see that showing up in 1983, that you, at age 16, which is at the left-hand side of that diagram, uh, a, bit, a much longer bar as people get licenses. What happens in 2010 is fascinating. There's a huge drop-off, and in fact, in the age cohort, in North America, from age 16 to 34, 26% of that age cohort has never gotten driver's licenses and has no intention of doing so. That is a remarkable, remarkable change. You see this also in terms of communities that are seen to be desirable. This is a study by uh, William Frey, a researcher at the Brookings Institution in Washington done in 2012, and what he's showing is the crossing of these curves that occurs in around 2006, 2007, and you'll see those dates cropping up in a number of different places, where on the bottom, what he calls city and dense suburbs, and he's looking at housing starts. The change, the percentage change in housing starts actually goes from a dipping curve to one which starts to rise, and in the upper, uh, the emerging, the uh, development at the periphery, uh, auto-oriented suburbs, you see a decrease, and you see a, a crossover in those two curves. This is a study done in Toronto, in my city, by uh, Toronto Dominion <coughs> Economics, and it shows on the left, and it, it's, again, it's the same year as that kind of 2006 year. On the left, we're looking at residential development, and the dark green represents the metro area, the, all of the periphery of Toronto. Again, it, it can be summarized by saying the auto-oriented development, which up until about 2006, that bar is much bigger than the yellow bar, which represents downtown Toronto. Then you have that shift, and suddenly, Downtown Toronto has overtaken the green bars. That we knew because we could see all the high-rise construction and development occurring. What we didn't know is what shows up on the right, which is the same thing for employment, the jobs, employers. And up until 2005, 2000 to 2005, there's actually a net decrease in jobs in the core because people are still building places of work out on the highways. By 2006 to 2011, all of a sudden, there's this huge change. Why? Because the employers are chasing their employees. They're chasing all those young people who don't have cars and don't have driver's licenses and don't want to. Uh, it's incredible. Um, this is 
showing where the growth is actually occurring in the large amalgamated city of Toronto. So you see population by census tract up above. Below, you see population growth by census tract, 2006 to 2011. An extraordinary change underway. Now this is producing, this is not without its problems, and it's producing uh, a very interesting phenomenon, and that is in any society, no matter what the political system, the people with the greatest means always end up living in what are seen to be the most desirable places. So this is a demographer at the University of Toronto who did a study looking at 1970 to 2005, again that, that magic year, and in 1970, the red at the left represents concentrations of poverty, so-called inner city poverty. You have a large yellow area which represents the middle class, and then you have the blue um, hatched area which represents higher incomes. By 2005, the poverty has almost been entirely exported from the pre-war city out into the first ring suburbs. The middle class, as we know in North America, has shrunk with polarization, and people of greater means are moving massively into the older walkable neighborhoods. So it, this is showing up over and over on the radar screen. Um, underlying this is the fact the good news side of this is cities are incredibly resilient. So one of the first cities where I got to ply my trade, so to speak, after leaving the city of Toronto where I worked as 10 years, for 10 years under three mayors as director of architecture and urban design was St. Paul, Minnesota. St. Paul is a capital city. It's at the further, furthest headwaters, navigable headwaters of the Mississippi. And it's a city which had peaked in terms of industrialization, mid-20th century. You can see that, other, that upper image, the river has been scoured. Uh, there's not a shred of vegetation uh, in, to make way for the barge fleet. Uh, but that city in the upper right, when I started working there in the mid-1990s for Norm Coleman, who was mayor, who then became a, a senator from Minnesota, was losing population, losing jobs. In fact, it was hemorrhaging. And you can see the extent to which the fabric of the city has been eroded to make way for parking lots. So it's that, that dominant paradigm that's taken over. From the mid-1990s on, there's been something of a miraculous change in St. Paul. Um, and that watercolor image on the lower left is something that we produced as part of a development framework for the city, which was all about reconnecting the city to the river cleaning the river, greening the river, connecting neighborhood to neighborhood, and filling in the heart of the city with new life. And the image on the lower right is um, a space which was owned by First Bank, one of the major banks in St. Paul. First Bank actually donated that site, which was a drive-in bank and a parking lot, to the city to create a public park, uh, which we developed through a competition which symbolizes the reconnection to the Mississippi River. So this is all about retooling cities for change as part of this paradigm shift. And it really involves a very complex and far-reaching transformation. It touches on politics at all levels. It touches on social and cultural values, the physical environment, and at the end, on individual choices. So I'm using this ecological image of upstream downstream to really symbolize and suggest all the ways in which this transformation is being felt and expressing itself. Um, a key part of the underpinnings of this from, a, from an intellectual standpoint really has to be traced back to Jane Jacobs' seminal work, Death and Life of Great American Cities in 1961. Um, Jane and I became acquainted in 1968 when we both moved to Toronto within months of each other. And as a young student, uh, I was nervy enough to actually ask her for a crit on one of my projects. And we became lifelong friends for about 40 years. And she really uh, is somebody I consider my greatest mentor. And she 
pushed us to an understanding of how cities actually work as opposed to the misconceptions that had been widely traded in those pre-war decades. And her key finding was something she took from biological science, which is this concept of organized complexity, that cities behave more like ecologies than they do like mechanical systems, which had been the, the way in which the dominant paradigm, which that Disney video portrayed cities and portrayed the relationships between the parts. So it, it is, this little diagram is really meant to suggest this very extraordinary set of interconnected dynamics. Key enablers being governance, leadership, and resources. But in terms of the paradigm shift, it involves embracing a new level of mix and diversity as opposed to the segregation of land uses, changing the way we move, the revival of the commons, seeing cities as part of nature, and this touches on all of these other aspects, ecosystem management, climate change, technology, connectedness, social cohesion. In other words, you can't just touch one of these issues, you have to touch them all. And so the goal in working on cities is really to arrive at virtuous circles, where you have reinforcing activities in one area that influence activities in others as opposed to, by implication, vicious circles which take you in a downward spiral. So right now, one of the key challenges we're facing is a whole new way of investing in transportation infrastructure which enables us to move other ways around the city, uh, active transportation, uh, transit, walking, and so on, and doing that retrofit of our infrastructure is as important as the building of the interstate highway program in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, forms of development that actually bring where we live, where we work, where we shop, closer together. Uh, retrofitting the public realm of our cities, the parks, squares, sidewalks, places of gathering, to create an opportunity for urban life. And all of this redounds to economic performance, to prosperity, to job creation, property tax, business tax, dollars generated for improvements. So hence, a circle. The transformations, and, and this, is, this is what I do every day. These are the projects that I'm working on, are occurring in parallel in the pre-war urban environments and in the suburban environments. So there's a project that I began with in the late 1970s, early 1980s in downtown Toronto, where what you see there on the left was all parking lots, like the image of St. Paul that I showed you. There's a recent project in Ottawa where a suburban arterial is being transformed with new light rail transportation, new mixed use development into becoming a more walkable, transit-oriented place. So in terms of mix and diversity, it's not just about density. It's how you make the density actually work. So Toronto is experiencing something which is almost crazy. If it is at the far left of that chart below. We have more high-rise residential construction going on in Toronto than New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Mexico City put together. There, there's this incredible growth in density in the city, which you saw in that earlier graph. But it's not just about the density. It's how do you actually mix uses, get living and working together, um, animated streets, doing all the things that make these real places. And so the really successful cities are the ones that are building sustainable neighborhoods that mix uses, that provide commerce, that provide social services, schools, daycare, libraries, recreation centers, not just clusters of condo buildings or office buildings. And of course you need the density to support those things, but making them present as part of the fabric is important. This, this is a, a neighborhood in Stockholm, a brand new neighborhood called Hammarby Soyestad. And it's a great example of providing that, what I, I was referring to as the new North American dream, but in this case, let, let's call it uh, a Swedish dream. Young families coming into this neighborhood, it's hard to imagine 
a better place to raise your kids, having more things in this neighborhood structured around the light rail line with beautiful access to this local waterfront in the lower uh, right hand side there's a factory building that's been converted into a library pretty much everything at your fingertips doing places that are compact and walkable is the key on the left is a project I've worked on in Cambridge Mass for a life science developer wanting to attract top scientists and the scientists coming out of their lab do not want to be in a science park. They want to be in the city. They want to come outside and that little square uh, that created with uh, a colleague I work with often, Michael Van Valkenburg, doubles as a skating rink in winter. It has restaurants, it has cafes, and in that little area you can take a small uh, kayak or canoe out onto the Charles River. Uh, there is live entertainment, there's, there's residential, there's pretty much the full array of urban life. On the right is a pedestrian street in Malmo, again in Sweden, um, where you have a layer cake. You have retail, restaurants, cafes on the ground floor. You have a floor of people working above that and people living above that. The mix doesn't have to be in every building, but it has to be in the neighborhood. We have to think about a diverse population people of different physical abilities, of different ages. We so often think about only healthy 20 or 30 year olds when we're designing cities. We have a population that is rapidly aging, a huge cohort. We have kids who are living in cities. We have to think about making cities work for the full life cycle and places where we can, as, as the phrase goes, age in place at different stages in our life and find appropriate accommodation. We have to learn how to skillfully layer on what exists. This is the neighborhood where I live currently, um, right on this park. This was an area that was the industrial powerhouse in Canada in the early 20th century. All those buildings that you see were mercantile, factory, warehouse buildings, all connected with the railway. It is now with this intensification, that's the view out my window, um, it has an extraordinary increase in people living in this neighborhood, but what's really interesting is there are more people working there than ever worked there during the industrial era. They're doing different kinds of jobs, but we're doubling the use, doubling the population, and intensifying the use at the same time. So changing how we move. This is a, a set of diagrams produced by the Board of Trade in Toronto showing levels of congestion which come from an over-dependence on the automobile. And on all the blue indicates areas of congestion. And it's estimated by the Board of Trade that hours lost due to congestion represents already, in 2001, a $6 billion drag on the regional economy, a loss of 26,000 jobs. By 2031, <coughs> they're claiming that unless we do something radical to change this, we will add 27 minutes to a commute which already is an average of 88 minutes a day. Now I realize in Manhattan, Kansas, that, that's a little hard to conceive that people would spend that much time in their days, but that's what's happening and that's the shift that has to occur. So there is a plan, a provincial and regional plan called the Big Move, which is involves a massive, massive reinvestment. It's a hundred billion dollar plan to retrofit and retool commuter rail lines, subways, light rail, bus rapid transit, uh, active transportation, and right now we're in the midst of a huge effort to generate a sustainable flow of revenue to produce two billion dollars of annual investments to start to work away on the implementation of this plan. Key to that is the integration of land use and transportation. So this is the, a subway line built 1949 to 1953, and at every one of the stops at that time has grown up a little city of 15 to 20,000 people who live and work at that transit stop. And that, that's really the key to making this work. We have, we, what's fascinating is the emergence of both low-tech and high-tech solutions to transportation. So who could have imagined 
25, 30 years ago that the bicycle would reemerge as a major form of urban transportation and you would have these bike sharing systems in uh, over 100 cities in the world and many more coming into play all the time that people would, ha would, to the extent that they use cars, would not own them, but would be sharing them through a variety of means. And what, what's fascinating is, you know, most young people, and I, I don't know how this works in this audience, but for most young people I talk to today, their major identity is tied up in this. It's what they carry in their pocket. It's not, as it was in my day, the car that they drive. If the car is just seen as a utility and not as something which defines who you are. Um, the other fascinating thing is the emergence of um, technology to integrate fares. My son lives in Tokyo and with his phone, he can pay for a cab, he can get on a subway, he can get on a train, he can buy a newspaper, he can buy a coffee, he can do all of those things by simply accessing the phone, as well as finding out the schedules and availability of all those forms of transportation. So it's a very interesting time. This shows you those shared cycling networks that are emerging all over the world. The most extensive is Paris, uh, but they're cropping up everywhere and they're spreading. And they're in I, I worked in Paris for a number of years and at the time that I worked there, no one would cycle. It was simply seen as dangerous, almost suicidal and the whole city has been changed by this. So one of the big items is in the shift is how, as this change occurs, we actually retrofit our rights of way, make them amenable. Um, a great example is New York City, and I'm sure many of you have had the chance to visit this, where uh, Janet Sadiq Khan, the Commissioner of Transportation in New York, introduced a project on Broadway from 23rd Street up to Columbus Circle at 59th Street where the scene on the right was transformed by making Broadway largely pedestrian. Starting off initially with temporary landscaping and basically a coat of paint and street furniture and now moving into a full-fledged permanent project. We have a whole new generation of engineers who are replacing the traditional traffic engineers who operate on the basis of a completely inverted set of priorities where cars are present in the rights of way, but priority is given to transit, to walking, to cycling, and these really interesting integrated designs, which you see in cross section here. Um, these are some examples from Spain, from Madrid and Barcelona. And what I th think is particularly important is if you look at the graphics of the street, the design of the street where every, everyone has their place, the transit vehicles, the cyclists, the pedestrians, they have their own signals. There's a kind of calmness and serenity to the way these streets are used and they're really designed now not where pedestrians are last in line, but pedestrians actually come first. There's a whole sensitization that has to happen around sharing the rights of way. This is a program in the UK and Spain uh, which is making people aware of cyclists and of the need to acknowledge the presence of cyclists. So along with this comes this issue of the commons, the spaces we share. And I know many of you are landscape architects. This, this is really uh, the bread and butter of what you do. And in increasingly heterogeneous cities, and I, I should tell you that in Toronto, more than half the population was born somewhere else. There is no majority population in Toronto. We are only a collection of minorities. So we have people from all over the world converging in this city, and it's happening in big cities everywhere. And what's really crucial are those spaces where we actually get to know each other, where we come together face to face at <coughs> eye level and make contact. Um, a great deal of my work is devoted to opening up waterfront spaces that were previously terra incognita. They were spaces that the public couldn't get access to. So on the lower left is a wonderful pedestrian cycle bridge in Toronto as part of a trail system that now runs all the way from Quebec City down to Windsor and Detroit along Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. 
Um, on the upper two images is Brooklyn Bridge Park, which I worked on the master plan for and worked with Michael Van Valkenburg to do the final execution, lower right Chicago, the great waterfront plan. As a result of all these, and this, this is back to Stockholm again, cities have the potential to become their own year-round resorts. So rather than escaping cities to other places, if you think about cities in this way, and this, this is a uh, deliberately selected image, images for both winter and summer, imagine the things that one can do in the heart of the city. So this is part of expanding the range, the capacity of cities, which leads directly to seeing cities as part of nature. For the longest time, we were, we were thinking, as you definitely saw in that Disney video, of us dominating nature, of shaping nature to our purposes. We've now realized our vulnerability uh, in an era of extreme violent events induced by climate change. So people understanding that their cities are part of ecoregions, that the recharge areas for rainwater, that the drainage of stormwater, that um, all of those watersheds and the geology of cities is an environment that we inhabit, that we have altered, but we also depend on for our survival. And so you have, on the one hand, this is Edmonton, where I've done a great deal of work, where the, the beautiful North Saskatchewan River comes through the city of Edmonton with 11 bows and just is an extraordinary landscape. But it's not always serene. We have events. Uh, such as Hurricane Sandy in New York, and I worked in Venezuela when this incredible landslide occurred on the Avila, and 15,000 people perished in about 10 minutes due to the mudslides coming down off that mountain. Um, we have to learn how to deal with uh, this, this set of risks, and it's a very powerful one. And this, this will, will lead to a huge amount of capital infrastructure work in cities to make them safer and to deal with uh, situations like uh, this uh, which you see in New York City and an opportunity to use this to create new forms of public realm, new types of connections. So it, it is both uh, a calamity but it also is creating new opportunities. Um, a scheme uh, for a competition that I won again with Michael Van Valkenburg and some other consultants for a new estuary for the Don River coming into Toronto Harbor where the floodproofing solution was actually to create a hundred acre park and make that the centerpiece of the neighborhood with it as a separate engineering exercise. Um, we unlike the sort of profligate use of resources that was implied in the Disney video, and I'm, I'm, I keep coming back to that, one of the most exciting things that's happening is learning how to harvest energy and reuse and recycle <coughs> from all sources, from buildings, from transportation, solar, geothermal, biomass, um, and to think of sustainability not as an overlay, not as a category, but really as the underlying principle by which we do everything. And a key concept there is land use. So in all the projects that I'm working on, um, on the right you see this concept of the essential DNA, that every phase of every project as much as possible, and I'm talking about the creation of urban neighborhoods, should create places of work, of living, of shopping, public spaces, access to transit, forms of mobility, recycling of heritage assets, and so on, rather than building out one part of the program in one phase and then hoping that the others will come. Um, I was talking to the students at lunch about this. One of the most exciting things for me in the change in my career, having been at this for many decades now, is our move out of professional silos into new forms of collaboration with new tools. Uh, this is the team that was working on the competition for the Lower Don, that river estuary that I showed you. And so we have around the table, around this table, planners, architects, landscape architects, engineers, ecologists, economists, social providers, artists, and 
quite literally, as we work together, the hierarchies are flattened. It's not a pyramid descending from one profession. It fosters lateral thinking, synthetic solutions, and it's a very exciting and dynamic way to work. It really is, the, the levels of creativity that are released are quite incredible. If we work in this way, we now have the science, we have the knowledge by moving beyond individual buildings and spaces and thinking about whole neighborhoods, whether uh, constructed all of a piece or retrofitting of existing ones to actually get to extraordinary reductions in energy consumption, uh, moving literally to the possibility of net plus, of actually putting energy back into the system. By the way, that Lower Don project was selected by the U.S. Green Building Council and the Clinton Foundation as one of the 16 climate change projects in the world that's being monitored for its ability to do that. So this, this is about a new form of sustainable prosperity. And in Canada, one of our provinces, British Columbia, has introduced a carbon tax. And this has resulted in a 17.4% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. But what's really interesting, all of the claims that you hear uh, from people who resist these kinds of changes, notwithstanding, the British Columbia economy slightly outpaced the rest of the country. So this, this is a really interesting lesson for all of us. So putting all these things together, what this is about is these transformations that are occurring both in the vast area of suburbia, where two-thirds of us in North America now live in these suburban metropolitan areas and in urban areas. And this, this is a, a plan that I worked on in a city of 700,000 people called Mississauga to the west of Toronto, built entirely around the automobile. And what you see is a regional mall built around 1960, sitting in the middle of farmers' fields, and then growing up around it has been this extraordinary density of population as it urbanizes and changes. And what's happening now, pursuant to the kinds of um, modifications and investments I'm I was talking about, is that vertical green line is light rail transit. The horizontal red line is bus rapid transit. What those circles represent are development opportunities that have been identified. And in the middle, around that uh, yellow odd-shaped building, which is the regional mall, that huge parking lot for thousands of cars is being carved up into city blocks and mixed use neighborhoods. That where the light rail line is going, which is on a suburban arterial, which could be anywhere in North America, zoning has already been introduced and plans are underway as this light rail is brought in to introduce the kinds of building fabric and mix of uses that you see in the lower image. So it's not about one thing. It's about projects that play all <coughs> notes, that play chords, not single notes. And so here are some examples, and it, it's occurring everywhere. On the upper left is another project I worked on in Cambridge for an area called North Point with a major uh, trail, the Minuteman Trail, one of the most important trails in New England coming to the Charles River and to downtown Boston. Upper right is Vancouver. Um, an area called Yale Town. Uh, the lower left is again that wonderful neighborhood in Stockholm. And on the lower right is a neighborhood in Paris around the Gare d'Austerlitz. Again, with all the attributes that I've been describing. As this happens, and I go back to St. Paul where I really cut my teeth on working at this scale, it's extremely important to present to communities, to populations, a tangible vision of the change, something that they can grasp. And so this watercolor not only helped people in the community understand it, actually became used on the logos of a number of municipal and county departments and corporations because it reflected a broad community aspiration. And taking that image, that bird's eye view, and making it happen involves frameworks like this, which depicted year by year Capital improvements, part of making the reconnections to the Mississippi River from neighborhoods to each other, 
and in the gray, the various development opportunities. So that dialectic between the public realm, the infrastructure, and the development is really crucial and getting all hands on board to do that. So le lest you think this is a, a cakewalk, um, this, is, this is very challenging. We don't have this button yet on our computers. Um, and in fact, in reality, uh, you need to understand that it, it often feels like this. You have very different competing visions, competing ideas, complex politics. Um, it's a many-sided tug of war in the case of cities. On the one hand, you have all the imperatives I've been talking about, social, economic, environmental, demographic, a new understanding of how cities work. On the other hand, we have inherited outdated structures, lack of resources, fear of change, societal divisions, ideology, vested interests. And I'm, I'm reminded of the fact that when Dwight Eisenhower left office as president, he made that very famous speech, one of his most famous perhaps, about beware of the military industrial complex. But we have a suburban industrial complex, which is just as powerful. It's an interwoven network, not of evil people, but of individuals, organizations, companies who were harnessed and who developed the skills to deliver that paradigm. And it involves uh, financial institutions, developers, lawyers, builders, brokers, real estate agents, road contractors, people who put in big pipes, all of which who have been highly organized, motivated, and who make a living producing this kind of fabric that you see below. So changing that is not simple. There is also a whole set of hidden subsidies and incentives built into our economic structures. And one of my colleagues, the economist Pamela Blay, has written a book where she analyzes in detail how all those subsidies play out and what would happen if you applied true cost accounting to development and would find, of course, that more compact forms of development are performing much better. For all of us in the allied professions dealing with cities, there is a huge demolition and rebuilding job to do. It involves starting at the bottom, policies, programs, plans, and projects. And it involves finding ways at every level, if you go back to my upstream downstream analogy, of countering the momentum and turning this battleship around. At a regional level, and again, these are from the Toronto region, um, things like a set of provincial policies which are interconnected and interwoven. A green belt, which is a, a growth control mechanism, growth limitation mechanism around the urban area. Um, a growth plan where shows where growth should be concentrated and the big move, the transportation infrastructure within that. So that's, that's at one level. Um, at other times, it's seeing the very big picture and very powerful design moves. And the big dig um, in Boston, taking out the central artery built in 1950 and replacing it with the Rose Kennedy Greenway is one of those. And I was fortunate enough in the aftermath of the big dig to work with Mayor Tom Menino and serve as the interim chief planner in Boston for two years, leveraging this extraordinary investment in changing that city. Um, sometimes it involves making a big leap. And Chris Turner is a colleague. He's an energy analyst in Calgary. He's written this very interesting book, uh, which is symbolized here by its cover of leaping from one speeding freight train to another. There's some places, sometimes, when incremental change doesn't work when you have to, at a certain point, make a substantial investment, a commitment, take a risk, and make the big leap. Sometimes the change is incremental. It involves bending the trend line. So this is, I'm working now as the master planner for Boston University. What's really interesting, if you look at these three lines where that trend line is bending, you see the increase at the bottom in walking and biking, the increase in public transit, the decrease in auto use. The combination of all of those is leading to this paradigm shift. Sometimes the leadership comes from the top. 
and sometimes it comes from communities. Uh, this amazing initiative to create a rail path, uh, which came from citizens groups and was implemented uh, through a variety of financial sources. It also involves the accumulation of thousands of individual efforts as small-scale entrepreneurs, individuals, companies respond to opportunities and make the shift in neighborhoods adjusting. And what's so fascinating is to see how these changes actually play out over time, to go back to someplace even two or three months later and to see all of the adjustments that have been made. Um, it's important also to occasionally sketch the future. Uh, there are all these uh, experiments. Broadway was one that inspired people. This is one I worked on in downtown Toronto where we took out a whole lane of traffic just to test out the idea of what if you were to widen the sidewalks on this main street. And the businesses experienced a 40% increase in sales. And so people had the courage to say, yes, this is a good thing to do. But most importantly, it's not optional. This is something, it's not about a lifestyle choice. What's really at stake, what underlies this, is that paradigm, that post-war paradigm, has literally tested to failure. It's not working. And our survival as a species really depends on making this shift. And we're now in North America, over 80% of us live in big, big metro regions. And in the world, we're approaching 50% of the world's population living in cities. So if we don't solve the challenges that we're facing in cities, there really is no other way to do it. And finally, it can't be top down. That these changes have to be made in our world, in any event, in a democratic political space that reflects how we actually live in cities. And I am deliberately showing this image with people your age because you have inherited an extraordinary mess that we created. And unfortunately, it's going to be up to you to turn it around. Thank you very much. Are we going to do any questions? I hope so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Okay. All right, the floor is open. Well, it, it is a very serious set of challenges, and um, I think people are now aware of it. Um, some of the things that need to be done include the transportation and infrastructure investments. Because with what we've, what's happened in Toronto with people arriving from all over the world, the first place of arrival used to be the older downtown city neighborhoods. And the advantage that they had is they were wired with subways, with streetcars. You had all of the uh, historic uh, sunk capital investment in uh, all kinds of institutions, um, access to jobs. And because those areas have been pretty much every part of the pre-war city has, has become more desirable, it actually costs twice as much per square foot to buy or rent a, a place of residence in the core as it does at the urban fringe. And so that has inevitably pushed people <laughs> out into those less successful places. And as I mentioned before, the assumption was when they were built is that every adult would have a car. 
Um, now, there are two problems with that. One is even if they had cars, the congestion makes it impossible to move around the region. And secondly, a lot of them don't have cars. So I think priority number one is this investment in light rail, in bus rapid transit, in uh, this uh, commuter rail, in, and moving away from radial systems to ones which actually blanket the region. Because a lot of the movement that's occurring where you have uh, in a household people having different jobs in different places is actually lateral movement from suburb to suburb. Whereas the assumption before was people lived in the suburbs and migrated laterally to the city center. Um, I think that's one major issue. I think uh, along with that, um, things like that example that I showed you in Mississauga of colonizing the arteries, the shopping malls, um, the many of the um, industrial parks which no longer function the way they did create opportunities for investment which becomes part of a strategy of a multi-centered region. Um, I also think that there's a big overlying issue which we share with you, um, which is not just about cities and it's about income polarization in North America. It's about the extent to which CEOs now, um, I heard these figures the other day, in, in the 1920s at the, at the peak of the robber baron era, heads of companies were making about 20 times what their employees were making. They're now making 270 times what their employees are making. So we have people who, are, who actually have minimum wage jobs and can't afford to but both put food on the table and provide shelter. So there are huge issues of social equity that I think play themselves out geographically in the city and are exaggerated by being in places that are auto-dependent. But uh, it's not only a matter of city planning or design. It, it's an issue of social values. And this, this whole push to austerity and to saying we can't afford to provide public spaces, social services, education, health, what, whatever uh, the topic is, is really uh, at stake as well. So, I, I think we're coming to a point where there is a significant pushback, um, but a recognition that, and, and this is perhaps most important, you know, if you take our city region, which the city of Toronto, the amalgamated city of Toronto is about 2.6 million people now. The current greater Toronto area is about six or seven million, but we're growing, we're one of the fastest growing city regions in North America for sure and right up there in terms of the world and so we're talking about a 10 million uh, number not too, that, not too far off. The city center cannot prosper if the hinterland is failing and conversely that hinterland depends on prosperity in the city center. So what's really crucial are articulating visions that combine improvements and prosperity in both areas in ways that are interrelated. So you have really important things like the universities are actually creating campuses that are occurring um, throughout the region so that students have more easy access to the campus, um, hospitals, clinics, um, pretty much it, it touches on everything but it, it, it is a huge issue. And I know somebody sooner or later is going to ask me about Rob Ford. So you, you must have heard of our uh, extraordinary mayor. So I, I'm going to give you a, a slightly different take on the Rob Ford phenomenon, which relates to the question that you just asked. You know, people around the world are saying, how could you have somebody like that as the mayor of a great city? Do you all know this story? I, I see some head shaking. We, we have a mayor who makes Marion Berry in Washington um, look like a, a sort of well-mannered citizen. Um, he just admitted to um, being a crackhead. Um, 
among, among many other misdemeanors and felonies. Uh, but he came to power because when the city was amalgamated in 1998, and this is not the only reason, but it's a significant part of the reason, two-thirds of the voters in Toronto, in what is now called the city of Toronto, actually live in those first-ring suburbs. And they are the people who are suffering in many ways, hugely dependent on automobiles, not much faith in the future, struggling with unemployment. And one of his first words, the words out of his mouth when he became mayor is, I'm going to end the war on the cars. So when I showed you that tug of war image, that's really what that's about. And this is forcing us, if there's a silver lining here, it is forcing us to confront this schism between the city and the first ring suburbs and the issues of how you make the transformation. So it's painful, it's embarrassing, but that is, that is a big part of that picture. Well, it, it's, um, it's absolutely crucial. I'm, I'm going to give you an example from St. Louis, which is a little closer here where I've been working. Um, it started with a winning a competition for the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial, that beautiful park with the Saarinen Arch, and then we started working on the surrounding neighborhoods. And what's really interesting is there is one light rail line which goes from the university, from Wash U, down to the Mississippi River. And if you look at where population is growing and shrinking in St. Louis, all of the, it, I, you're probably all familiar with this website called WalkScore. So if you look on WalkScore, you will see that all the increases in population are occurring along that transit line. And the moment you get away from that transit line, all of those neighborhoods are either stable or shrinking. So even in a city which is not a big transit city like St. Louis, this phenomenon is, is playing out. So I, I, I think the cities across North America that have actually embraced this are the ones that will succeed. And developing, and that's why I end with this slide about politics, developing a regional consensus on revenue tools, whether through bonds, tolls, gas taxes, property taxes, parking levies, wh whatever the basket of sources is, what you need is a long-range, dependable flow of funding in order to make this shift. What do you think are the most valuable skills or knowledge or values for young aspiring city planners and city builders to have in the coming year? What would you look for? Well, as, as I was saying to the smaller group of students at lunch, I, I think it's listening, it's observing, but very importantly, it's becoming as aware as you can of these big transformational trends that provide the context, both temporal and spatial, for the work that you will be doing. Seeing things in the fourth dimension, seeing, stepping outside the professional boundaries that have been assigned to you and reaching out to others who are working in related areas. And, you know, I'll, I'll a really uh, great experience for me was working on that competition for the Lower Don River. And what, the way that came about is the city and the agency that was charged with that flood proofing issue um, called Waterfront Toronto was doing what we used to do, which it, it had assigned flood proofing to one group through an environmental impact study. Uh, another group was looking at transportation. Another group was looking at municipal services and utilities. Another group was looking at park creation. Another group was looking at economic development. And what they were producing was a horrible patchwork scheme of conflicts. And so a few visionary people at a political level said, time out, this is not working. And what they did is they 
called an international competition, a two-stage competition, an invited competition, and the competition required us to have on the team, it was the most complex group of people I've ever worked with, we had physicists and biologists who were looking at river behavior so we could truly understand that. Uh, we had all the disciplines that I mentioned in the slide, and not that the competition produces the final outcome, it never can with something as complex as that, but it got to an integrated approach and then we went through with citizens and with all the agencies the steps to, to get to a final solution which, which has been adopted. But you would never get there without that extraordinary across-the-board collaboration. And I think people in our professions who are most adept at understanding what all the people in other related professions can bring to the table and in conversing with them and drawing on that knowledge are the ones who will be the most able in practice. Well, I, I think the most difficult, if, if you look at the, at the suburbs, and in particular those first ring suburbs, because especially in the States, more so than in Canada, you still have great wealth in the suburban areas. Canada has become more like Europe, where if you go to the outskirts of Paris, where all the riots occurred, um, it's where more or less poor people live. Um, I, I think that's much less true in the, it's a much more complicated situation in the U.S. Um, but the, if you look at it from a physical design standpoint, it's easier to see places that are in single ownerships, like those big malls, and how they get the regional malls, and a lot of them are being transformed. It's easier to see how you can transform the arterials, especially when you bring in transit, or the industrial parks. The trickiest part are the thousands of square miles of cul-de-sacs and individual houses. And what's happening there is interesting. I, I've seen, I'm going to describe three different scenarios. By the way, Jane Jacobs wrote a book, the last book she wrote was called A Dark Age Ahead, which is not really as pessimistic as the title sounds. <laughs> um, but she devotes a chapter to what will happen to the suburbs. And in typical Jane Jacobs fashion, um, she was and she was writing long before the housing crisis in the U.S. and the subprime mortgages and all the rest of it. Uh, but she said, th "What will change the suburbs will be a force majeure. It will be an economic crisis that will be so powerful that all of the deeds and all of the zoning provisions and all of the codes." will simply be swept away because people will have to make changes. And so the three examples I'm, I'm going to describe to you are versions of that. One of them is I have seen in prosperous cities like Minneapolis, not to mention Detroit and Cleveland and the, and the more obvious ones, but I've seen in prosperous cities like Minneapolis where people have simply walked away from the houses, boarded them up, and they get torn down or uh, simply disintegrate. So that, that's the most dire example. And then you, you know, Detroit actually has developed this very significant mm -hmm. urban farming industry that's occurring in, in some of those, those blanked out areas. Um, another thing that I'm seeing is doubling up. So it's exactly the same thing that happened in inner city neighborhoods when they were seen as less popular, what were great houses built for families got chopped up into flats and apartments or rooming houses. And so in those suburbs, even though it completely conflicts with the zoning that speaks to single family houses, you're getting either multi-generational families or you're getting unrelated people just dividing up the house and you're also getting people running businesses out of those houses which is prohibited by zoning, people just surviving, adapting, doing what they need to do. 
Um, a third example, and we're starting to see this in Toronto, is as difficult as it is, developers who are actually assembling whole neighborhoods, just buying the houses one by one by one and tearing them down and producing denser urban fabric. So one thing we know for sure is nothing holds still. And change will occur, and if it's, if it's not, if you don't, and that's why I say it's such an interesting design problem, because if you don't think of creative, positive solutions, you'll get cataclysmic change that you won't like. Yes. Okay, so I moved from Vancouver this year, um, and I'm learning a bit about Kansas City metro area. Um, but my experience in this Canada and Vancouver had a little bit more federalist sort of metro focus, where there was more political will willpower at that level. Well, you know, we, we have, I have to say, Vancouver does pretty well. We're struggling with this in Toronto. Uh, Montreal is struggling with it. Um, Calgary and Edmonton are a little different because the city actually extends all the way out to the limits. But I think it's, there's some good examples in the U.S. The Regional Planning Association in New York metropolitan area, the RPA as it's called, actually extends out to include parts of Connecticut, New Jersey, um, Long Island, and so on, and really thinks about big transit solutions, particularly rail and big solutions to environmental problems. I, I think the environmental issue, I think the tr the, the, there are some issues that cannot be solved at the local scale. So, you know, this principle of subsidiarity, that you solve the problems at the, at the lowest competent scale that you can, but things like transit, obviously regional fare integration, regional systems, simply transcend those local boundaries. Um, things like hydrology, flood proofing, uh, water systems, obviously don't know political boundaries. There are social issues that do the same. And I think we're, what I, I see is we are moving from special purpose bodies that in some cases are entrusted with dealing with a single issue are now starting to make links to other special purpose bodies leading to a new level of regional thinking. Um, I'm really fascinated. I mentioned Tokyo. Uh, well, I'm fascinated with Tokyo with a city of 23 million people which is divided into 23 districts, each district, the average size of those districts is a million people. But funnily enough, in that megalopolis, people have more access to local government. They feel closer to local government than we do in Toronto because they have local city halls, they have power at that district level to actually make decisions and even though the, all the big transit systems and so on are obviously regional and national. The service providers for things like libraries, schools, community centers, daycare, all those things are actually very much the province of those local districts. Um, Mexico City, for all of its problems, has something similar. It, it's a city of similar size and the federal district, which is almost like a country, is broken down into delegaciones, which are big areas, which are then further broken down into colonias. And the colonias are actually neighborhoods, and they have their own political leadership. So I, I'm very fascinated by this idea of how you have these nesting boxes of authority so people don't feel like they're losing control. I want people to be closer to local decision making on things that they can deal with, but at the same time you need this federated approach to some of these bigger issues. And, and this is where um, 
what was so interesting about the, the great landscape architects of the latter part of the 19th century, early 20th century, is their ability to conceive of physical ideas that embraced whole city regions. And the most, the most one that comes to mind that I guess I know most about is the Grand Rounds in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the Twin Cities, conceived by Horace Cleveland, which actually is still functioning as a template that those two cities are following over 100, you know, 120 years later. Um, and it's quite remarkable. And if you, if you know the chain of lakes on the west side of Minneapolis or some of the pieces of this that have been fully implemented, they're, they're extraordinary. The Minneapolis Parks Board actually is working on Horace Cleveland's plan. Um, so uh, you know, having these big regional systems, trails actually, interestingly enough, are becoming something that have, have uh, really become a subject of regional cooperation. There's a trail system emerging, as I mentioned, all the way from Quebec City following the St. Lawrence River down to Windsor, Detroit, but also all the way around Lake Ontario, the American side and the Canadian side. And so sometimes you need things, you need tangible things that people can gravitate to and say, yes, I see the benefits in that. It, it's a very fertile field with lots of possibilities. Well, I, I just think in our, in our world, um, as opposed to the Gulf states or China or places where you ha can have a, a dictator who will simply Im impose these things, unless you bring folks on side, it's just not going to happen. I mean, for the very simple reason that if, if you want to have revenue streams to make the transportation infrastructure You've got to have bills that pass through the state or provincial legislatures that um, enable this to happen. And if there is not constituent support for it, politicians will run against it as opposed to for it. So it's, it's, it's just something which is uh, part of the reality that we deal with. And I think it's a good thing. I, I would much rather have that than the contrary. <laughs> to have someone lay out such an articulate roadmap for you. And I really appreciate Ken coming to talk with us. I appreciate Jason Brody hosting the visit and making sure that it happens. And all of you for staying. <laughs> 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 thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you.